Good afternoon and welcome everybody back to another installment of Donor Search's 2019 Flash Class Series. We're glad you're able to join us, but we're going to take a little bit of a break and allow people to join. So sit back, grab something to drink, and uh, hope you enjoy the broadcast. Hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to another installment of Donor Search's 2019 Flash Class Series. I'm so happy that everyone could join us. My name is Terrence, and I'm here at Donor Search filling in for Jay as he travels today, and I'll be moderating today's class. I'll start by reviewing some housekeeping rules. The first thing we'll address is the presenter slides for you today will be sent, and a recording of this will be made available within the next day or so. Within the time frame, if you wish to go back and listen to today's session, you can do so by heading over to DonorSearch.net and clicking on the Resources tab just at the top there. This will show a drop-down menu, and you can click on today's Flash Class Library. You'll be able to see all of our previously recorded sessions, and you'll be able to search by keyword or speaker. Moving on, we'll, take about, we'll talk about questions. While your mics are muted to prevent any ambient background noise, we still encourage you to interact and ask questions. You can do so at this point in the presentation by clicking on the questions box located on the GoToWebinar control panel. Now to get to today's good stuff. Our flash class will be talking about respecting your donors, gender inclusive data management, our speaker today, Amanda Jarman, works right into the heart of this product and this topic as the president of the Fundraising Nerd and will undoubtedly bring some helpful and actionable insight. Amanda will be discussing how to choose and manage your donor data directly and how it impacts and relates to our donors. As transgender people move to become more culturally visible, many organizations are making changes to their data management practices to be more inclusive for diverse gender identities. I know you're looking forward to hearing me stop talking, so I'll go ahead and pass the baton over to Amanda. Amanda, welcome to the stage. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm uh, looking forward to today's topic, and um, I'll pop up my slideshow as soon as you're ready for me to do that. And here uh, we go. Have a notification. There we go. Perfect. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for being here. This is. One of my favorite topics to speak about of late, both because I think it's very important and I also think it's cutting edge. So kudos to you for, um, I hope you agree with me. Ah, there we go. Well, um, I got a little bit of an introduction already, so I won't spend much time on myself because I really want to get into the meat of the topic, but I will mention I've been in the nonprofit sector for two decades now, and most of that has been in the area of donor data management. And this issue around gender identity and how we manage that data, I would say has really, in my world at least, emerged within the last five years or so. Certainly, issues around gender identity and acceptance of transgender people have been um, at, you know, part of our culture for much longer than that. But in terms of discussions in the fundraising data management world, it's pretty new still, and people are still figuring out what to do. Um, so that's why I just love this topic. And it really um, has a lot to do with the biographical data that we collect. It also touches on data hygiene and the workflows that we do. And that's the kind of work that I do with nonprofit organizations through my firm, Fundraising Nerds. So today we are going to talk about um, gender identity. And I'm going to start with why this matters. Why does this matter um, that we think about our database and our business processes around gender and how we track and share that kind of information. And there's really three points that come 
to mind for me. The first is being respectful. We always want to respect our constituents and do right by them, no matter what their identity is or what their background might be. Another is safety, and I'll talk more about that, but uh, believe it or not, the way that you treat your donor's data, in this case, could actually be a safety issue. And the third is changing demographics, which is that um, the tide is changing, and if you want to be uh, moving with the way that the culture is moving, then this is an issue that you'll be addressing in your data management. So first off, respect. Data elements are often about people's identity, and this is not just in terms of gender identity, but names. Do they prefer to be called by a nickname? When you do your annual donor report, how do they want to be listed? Do they want to be listed? Are they an anonymous donor? What are their relationships with other people, and how do you describe those? And how do you send mail to the household? Which person is listed first? These all get to how a person identifies who they are. And we also have you know, giving preferences. That's another place that somebody has identified, I'm interested in this. So there's a lot of different ways that we can set up our donor data management to acknowledge someone's unique identity and to respect them. And today we'll be talking about just one aspect of that. I also mentioned safety, and this is a, just a really tragic reality, which is that transgender individuals face a higher rate of violence than cisgender individuals. And I'm gonna do some definitions in a moment. Um, but basically, if you are transgender, you're more likely to face violence than somebody who does not identify as transgender. And that's really troubling. It also means that if somebody notifies us and lets us know that they would like to update their name in our database system, we darn well better do that because if we're sending mail to them and it's got the wrong um, name on it, we could potentially out them to one of their members and that's going to be a real problem. We also have the issue of changing demographics. So if you take a look at this survey that was done by GLAD in their sex at birth. And that's really stunning um, to me. I was surprised, I'll be honest, when I saw that. Deck, you're going to see a lovely chart that says that 12% uh, of people between the ages of 18 and 34 um, identify as transgender or some variation thereof, which is, to me, I was honestly surprised. I, when I was doing research for this presentation, I thought, my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be that many people. Um, so what's the good news here? It's that often doing the right thing is actually easy. I'm going to show you some ways in which um, making your database more inclusive actually simplifies your data management workflow, um, which is kind of the icing on the cake. So let's start with some important terms because I don't want to throw words around without uh, defining them first. So it's important to separate out sexual orientation from gender identity. I think those two concepts often get confused for people. Sexual orientation is the gender of people to whom a person is attracted. Um, so that doesn't have anything to do with who they themselves are in terms of their gender identity. It has to do with the gender identity of somebody that they are attracted to versus their gender identity, which is the gender that a person perceives or knows themselves to be. Contrast that with sex, which is the label that you're assigned at birth based on your biological features. So if those two things agree with one another, if you are assigned female as a sex based on your biological features when you're born, and your gender identity is also female, then you are what's called cisgender. That's your, where your gender identity matches the sex that you are assigned at birth, versus transgender, where your gender identity does not match the gender identity that you are assigned at birth. A couple of other important terms, um, pronouns. I know that's, everyone's like, I know what a pronoun is. But you might be starting to see um, if somebody sends you an email or if you're in a meeting, perhaps people are disclosing their pronouns to you. I use she, her, and hers, for example. Or somebody else might say, I use they, them, and theirs. So a pronoun is what's the correct way to refer to someone in the third person. And finally, um, dead naming. That's a really brutal sounding term and it is for a reason. It's using someone's legal or birth name instead of the name that they prefer. And that's something where um, our data management practices really come into play. If we are accidentally outputting mail with the wrong name on it, that's a pretty serious error and it's 
considered to be very offensive. So um, that's where that can really come into play with our data management. So what does this mean for your database? There's a few places that I want to talk about today, and I also invite if you've got other data management areas in your database that you think are impacted by this issue and I haven't listed them here, please chat in your, your thoughts and your questions. I definitely would love to hear from everybody. What are you thinking? Um, am I on the right track? What would you add to this? Is anything unclear? But today we're going to talk about names, gender, pronoun, gender-based titles, and relationships in your database. These are all places where um, this can come into play. So in terms of names, we always want to address our constituents by their preferred names. And this is really regardless of gender identity. If someone says, I want to be called Twinkles, great. We're going to send you your next fundraising appeal. So dear Twinkles, um, thank you so much for your generous support of our organization. Um, you know, we don't care what someone wants to be called. We're going to honor that. And that's something that we want to do with all of our constituents. One of the issues that comes up is, should you keep track of somebody's former name, their legal name or their birth name, if they change their name? And my question for you is, what is your compelling business need? So people who work in higher education, for example, they often do need to keep track of someone's legal name for um, federal aid purposes, for legitimate legal reasons. Similarly, if you are in a healthcare situation, you might be billing somebody's insurance using the name that is on their social, social security card and their health insurance, but you actually want to address them as a patient or as a constituent by their chosen name, by the name that they feel best represents who they are. Those are good reasons to source someone's legal or birth name. A bad reason is for data maintenance reasons, and that's you know a question that's come up for me before. Amanda, should I store someone's um, former name it's going to really help me when I want to do a wealth screening with donor search, or it's going to really help me when I want to go do my NCOA update or any other sort of data research. And I say, yes, it sure will help you with your screening. It sure will help you with your NCOA. But it is not a compelling enough business need in terms of the risk of privacy breach. And that's both pulling the wrong report or pulling the report with the wrong name field output on it, and also you know, who has access to your database in your organization? If there's a wide array of people that are in there, if they see that somebody's name was Michael and now it's Janet, they're probably gonna make some assumptions. And frankly, it's not up to us as data management professionals to out somebody as transgender. And sometimes that's what we might be doing in effect by storing that legal or birth name. So one of the things to keep in mind is how you're going to, if you do need to store this information, how are you going to keep it protected? How are you going to make sure that it's never output on reports? What are your quality assurance processes? Do you have ways to restrict certain people from seeing all of the fields in your database? Maybe this is not information that every single person who's in your system needs to be privy to. So lots to think about in terms of storing someone's name. What about tracking gender? A lot of databases have a field to track gender. And I've seen um, from okay to pretty terrible. Um, pretty terrible is a database that allows you to select between male, female, and other, which is just terrible. Nobody wants to be called an other. Um, that just doesn't feel good and is you know, anti-inclusive, if you will. Okay, so most of our databases have a place where we can track gender. But here's a question. Do you need to? What are your business needs for tracking this information? Is it something, are you an all girls school? And, and so this actually comes into play for you, perhaps. Um, there may be other compelling reasons. Again, if you're an educational institution, it's, uh, whether that be higher education or a secondary school, uh, you're likely to, you might be likely to have a database that combines student information and fundraising, fundraising information. In that case, you're probably gonna have a gender field in your database. Um, so we'll talk some more about that in a moment. But for other folks, you may not have a compelling business need for gender. And I think one of the things that can happen with our databases is that we try to fill in all the fields because we want to be accurate and we want to be complete. And we may not stop to think, do I actually need this information? And this is really a point beyond tracking gender or not, but 
just a general data management best practice, which is if you don't need it, don't track it because it's just time that you're that that you spend maintaining it, or else you're not maintaining it, and then you've just got some inaccurate, outdated data in your database. So don't feel compelled to use all the fields until you really have a business need for them. And what I mean by business need is there's something you're doing in real life with this data. This data is not just hanging out in your database waiting for some day, but in fact, you're making use of it on a regular basis. So I had one client that I talked to them about this. You know, this all makes good sense. Um, a lot of our donors are international and I'd like to have some sort of an understanding of, of them as a person and understand a bit about their identity when I'm calling them up, especially since it's really hard for me to take a, a cue from names because some of these folks are from cultures that I'm not super familiar with. Okay, well that's actually, you know, that's legit. So I said, well, what if you were to track pronouns instead? And um, they said, you know, that would work for us. So instead of tracking this person as male or female, or a different gender, um, we just track this person prefers, or I'm actually I'm gonna talk about prefer in a moment. I think prefer is problematic when it comes to pronouns. That was a nice your afternoon alliteration. Um, but we could track their pronoun. Uh, do they get called he, him, and his, they, them, there, she, her, fit, hers? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. If you do need to track gender though, because sometimes you just might need to, Let's take a cue from Tinder. So I'm not gonna ask for a poll of who's used Tinder out there. You know who you are and whether it works for you or not. But one thing I think that Tinder does really well, um, and this is actually from a few years ago, so they uh, may have even improved things since then, but they did a really nice job with collecting gender information. And so, and I don't expect that most of us or any of us on this phone call are going to have the programming budget of Tinder. So you may not be able to exactly replicate this, but it is something to consider in your systems design. So when you establish your Tinder account and you're asked to identify your gender, you start typing into an open box and then it will suggest autocomplete based on other users and what they've filled in. You could say, yeah, actually that label really, that's, that's me, I'm gonna use that one. Or you can just make up your own completely. The point here, or I don't mean make up your own completely as in that, you, I mean that you don't have to be constrained by the labels that are offered, um, that, that are pre-selected. The real point of this is that if you are going to track gender identity information about people, you always have to offer that there's another way that I identify it, and here's what it is. And then it's something that you have to track in your database. It's not just, um, oh, okay, well, that's nice they filled out this form. And if we're gonna ask for the data, we need to take it seriously. So here's an example of how you might do that. You might say, what is your gender? And offer um, a variety, and including prefer to self-describe and prefer not to say. Again, don't offer other, that's just, um, minimizing and alienating to people. So I think if we're gonna collect this information, it's, we've gotta do it the right way. And this is the one place in your database where I would say that setting up your systems to be respectful and inclusive is more complicated. And that's why I say if you don't need it, don't track it. But if you do, please offer multiple options and always offer that self-defined option. Keep in mind that this is probably not how your database works right out of the box. If it is, awesome. Um, shoot me an email later and tell me which database you're using. Um, but we'll, we'll do that offline, most certainly. But probably your database does not work like this. And you may have a gender field that's customizable, which is great. You may not. And if you don't, you might need to program your own custom field then. And that's something um, that if you're not sure how to do, that's a great time to work with your database vendor. I always love to encourage people to call your vendor and tell them what you're trying to do. That's called a use case. And your use case is, here's what I'm trying to accomplish with my database. And so you can describe to them, I'm trying to collect gender information in a way that's inclusive and respectful, and I need to be able to offer multiple options. I also need to be able to allow people to self-describe, so I need to be able to update my data my database with a self-described option whenever that's provided. And 
whether that's going into your gender code table and adding another gender code, or whether it's adding a free text field where you can store self-described data. You know, that's up to what you need, what your database's capabilities are. And you know, certainly present your business needs to your vendor and ask them to partner with you to help you solve these issues. Um, don't do it on your own, because that's why you pay for support, right? All right, so gender. Probably the most complicated thing we're going to talk about today in terms of tracking it in your database. In my mind, much easier, pronouns. Um, I just feel like there are fewer pronoun options out there, although I say that there are literally dozens um, that people might use. But most commonly, you're going to hear the big three at the top here. A little less common, you might hear the and here. Um, that's a gender neutral pronoun that gained a lot of traction in the early 2000s. And I've been hearing it less lately than they, them, and theirs, but that's not to say that people don't still use it. Um, and this link and many more, when you get the slides, uh, if you, you can click on it and it will give you a, an astonishing array of pronouns that people might use. So a little like gender, if you're tracking pronouns, this is another place to allow people the opportunity to self-describe. But like I said, you'll, you'll receive less variation and it tends to be a less personal sort of, it's still a personal question, but it tends to be a little less personal than what is your gender identity, but what is your pronoun? And I promise to talk some about this idea of preferred. Um, when people were really starting to grapple with this idea of how do we be more inclusive, how do I ask somebody um, to, how to address them in a way that's respectful, it was very common to say, what is your preferred pronoun? And these days I'm finding that that is, is a little bit more frowned upon, the idea being that somebody's pronoun is not a preference, it just is. They are a he, him, his. They are a her, she, hers. Um, so I would shy away from using that term of preferred, whereas for name, I feel like that's, it's less problematic because when you go and choose a new name for yourself, you truly have, you've selected a name, you've decided on that name that you prefer. Whereas you're not really selecting a gender, you're not selecting a pronoun, you are that gender, you are that pronoun. And that's a subtle distinction, um, but one where I would say, if you're in doubt, shy away from preferred and just go with, what is your name? What is your gender identity? What is your pronoun? Okay. Gender-based titles. This one is, a, this one to me is kind of a no-brainer, although there are some reasons that you may not be able to follow my number one advice, which is get rid of these things. So when I say gender-based titles, I mean Mr., Mrs., Ms., Miss, which I don't even think I put on that slide, um, but you still probably, you might have some Miss M-I-S-S in your database. A lot of organizations that I've been talking to and working with are just saying, you know what, let's get rid of these all together. Um, and so instead of sending mail to Ms. Amanda Jarman, we're just going to send mail to Amanda Jarman. Um, and I think that is the easiest solution if you can swing it. Of course, don't get rid of your honorary titles. People work hard for their doctor, their reverend, their sergeant major. Um, so those we don't want to touch. Those are really important and have nothing to do with somebody's gender. They have everything to do with what somebody's you know, achieved in this lifetime. So don't get rid of those. But if you can get rid of gender-based titles, awesome. You may not be able to, um, depending on your organization's kind of your brand, if you will. What, what are your donors like? Do you have a pool of donors that skew towards a little older and more traditional? You may have donors in your database who care very deeply about being addressed as Mr. or as Mrs. And if you're not sure, ask them. It is a great donor stewardship move to reach out to your donors and say, hey, I want to know more about how you prefer to be addressed. We've been thinking about simplifying our mailing labels. And I know that sounds really like, why would I call a donor over my mailing labels? But it turns out, and this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pull out an old fundraising saw here, but if you want money, ask for advice, but if you want advice, ask for money, right? So every opportunity that we have to engage with our donors is an opportunity to bring them closer to our organization and closer to giving to us. And there's no difference when it comes to developing our data management standards, it turns out, because the way that we send mail to our donors, the way that we address them, 
affects our relationship with them. And so it's a legit thing to ask questions about. So if you're not quite sure how would my donors feel about us changing the mailing label, pick a solid 25 or so at random from your database and you know, make sure then that they, they seem to be a mix of, you know, generational mix if you can. And give them a call and just see how they feel about it. See if they're really fiercely attached to that Mr. and Ms., et cetera. If you do decide that gender-based titles are important, then please add MX to the mix. MX is a gender-neutral title um, that can be used in that field. And then, of course, you're going to want to add that to anywhere that you're collecting um, title data. So if that's on your online giving site, great. Please go ahead and update that drop-down if it's on your event registration, wherever you're collecting that kind of information, then give that MX option as well. Another, to me, easy update to make, and this one I think should be very non-controversial, although I did, I did hear from someone once that there was a little bit of controversy in their office over doing this, but if you um, are tracking relationships in your database, and if you're not yet, please start. Um, once you've got your um, fundamental biographical data entry and your gift data entry, if you feel solid about those things, they're working well for you, then relationships are the next thing to start thinking about. Knowing who in your database knows one another, either through family relationships or acquaintanceships or any other sort of relationships that they might have with one another is really valuable information. It's something that's going to help you with your donor prospecting. It's going to help you identify who can open doors for whom. It might help you identify those sort of um, legacy family gifts. So if you're not collecting relationship data, please do. It's fabulous. Um, and you can make it a lot easier to manage if you um, simplify your coding. So instead of tracking mother and daughter, use parent and child. Instead of brother and sister, use sibling and sibling. Um, the only one that I haven't, like I, I was, somebody stumped me on this one recently, um, and I don't have a great answer to it, I'll be very honest, is like, um, nieces and nephews and uncles and aunts. Uh, we don't really have a great gender neutral term for that. Um, that's something that maybe we could just code them as a family member or if somebody out there knows of an awesome gender neutral term that means aunt and uncle, um, let me know because I would, I would love to, maybe it's a, like an archaic term, who knows. Um, but this one I think is another one of those, it's easy to do and it makes your coding so much more simple. Uh, any place in your database where you can have a fewer number of codes is really a very lovely thing, except for one place. I am such a fan of having a huge number of appeal or solicitation codes because I love segmentation. I want to know exactly where my dollars are coming from. Like, that's the one code table where I'm like, yeah, let's have lots of them. But most code tables in your database, the more simple that you can make that coding, then the better it's going to be. Um, and this is one area where you can really simplify things. I'm curious if there's anyone out there that has other places in your database where you've got gender identity issues that are coming into play for you. So please you know, speak up if that's the case. Hi, Amanda. It seems that we have a uh, Kathleen has provided a gender neutral term for the uh, niece and nephew, a nibling, yes. N I B L I N G. N I B L I N G? Yes. That oh, from Kathleen. Me. Thank niece you. And nephew. Okay, that's so fabulous. That's one of the things I love about um, this particular community of people. Um, fundraisers and fundraising data managers are such awesome um, co-learners. And so I always know if I'm doing a presentation, I'm like, you know, I actually don't know. I bet somebody out there will. So nibbling. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, That's thank you, wonderful. Kathleen, for uh, providing that. That's great. And I am happy to keep moving, but do we have any other questions that um, people are burning at this moment? Uh, next, I'm going to move into the data collection side of things. I think that was probably the only one for right now. Oh, no, we just got one. Um, this is from Melissa from the University of Michigan. She's curious if anyone thought of a gender neutral term for alumni. They were thinking using alum X um, right now. Oh, that's a great question. You know, what I've heard people using is using the plural alumni. 
kind of like them and they instead of he or she. Um, and it's controversial, and it's especially at uni in university settings. It's like, that's not correct. But using alumni, in the, when you would use alumni or alumnus, for example. I like alumnex, though. Um, are there any other higher ed institutions out there that have faced that? And if so, what are you doing? Because I would love to hear that, too. That's a great question. Um, I think we have here from Meredith. She's saying that you could use alumnae or just I when addressing multi-gender or just using alum or just alums, just abbreviating it. Oh, uh, there you go. That what that works too. I think just, you know, let's get rid of the tail there. That works. I like that one. Okay, thank you, audience participants. That's so fabulous. All right, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna collect this data. So the first thing is this has got to be a team effort. Um, and, and this is this is what I would say this is true for a lot of data collection that we do, especially when it has to do with people's biographical data. Um, usually those of us in the fundraising shop, and I'm going to put a big asterisk by that, um, but usually in the fundraising shop, we own the fundraising data. That's really our domain and we're responsible for it. Um, there are some quirky exceptions to that rule, of course, there always are. But when it comes to biographical data, when I say biographical data, I mean names, addresses, other types of contact information, um, communication preferences, mail me, don't mail me, email me, here's my email address, all of that kind of data, that's often where our data management overlaps with other teams within, within our organization, um, and that may be at a very large, complicated organization where we've got all these kind of data silos all over the place that are trying to interact with one another, or it might be at the smallest nonprofit organization where your front desk person has a relationship with your volunteers who also give you money, and so it turns out that your front desk uh, person is a vital link in your biographical data management. So it's definitely a team effort. The first thing to do is to identify all of the people or teams in your organization that are touching your constituent data, particularly that biographical data, and any of those data points that we talked about today, um, name, gender, uh, pronoun, relationships, etc. The next step is if you don't already have some sort of work group around data management. And if you don't, I totally recommend that because um, it's a great way to tackle these sorts of issues when they come up and all kinds of issues around what are our data entry and data management standards, what reports do we need, how do we need to be setting up our database so that all of us who are using it are using it consistently. So having a regular uh, database users group can be really helpful. If you don't have that, then it's a great, this is a great effort to create a task force around um, because it's going to be really important for you to have multiple voices at the table. Make sure that you understand all of the different ways that you're using this data. Um, for example, one of the things that has come up a lot in the world of higher education is that a student may notify the university that they are going by a different name now but they may not have also notified their parents of that change. So when the university goes to send mail to the parents and they're referencing the student, what name should they use? They want to be respectful of the student's choice. They also don't want to unintentionally out the student to the parent. So that becomes a workflow challenge. And it's something where on the fundraising side of the equation, we may not be thinking about that, but if we're in the registrar's office, that's probably come up more than once. So that's why it's so important to have all of these different people who are all touching the data on the team having the same conversation. So one of the things that will be important is if you don't feel like you have the requisite expertise in-house to make some decisions around this kind of data, and you know, certainly hopefully this webinar today is going to help you make some of those choices. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to offer some resources to you. And it's also something where there are resources in your community. So if you are a nonprofit organization and your focus is not on um, serving 
LGBTQ, um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and questioning people. Um, if that's not your primary area of focus or your primary service area, you may need to call on one of those organizations and say, hey, you know, we're trying to do this right and we want to be respectful. Can you help us? Can we ask you some questions about the best way to do this? Or if you're on a campus, um, you probably have resources on campus for your students and those resources can also be helpful to you. So I have a colleague who is at UC Davis. They recently went through this extensive process of updating their database, updating their data management, and um, taking a more inclusive approach. And their resource center for gay students was incredibly, incredibly gay and transgender students, I should say, was incredibly helpful for them in being thoughtful and thinking through this effort. So know that you're also not in this alone. Um, get everybody internally on the team that you need to, but don't be afraid to go outside your organization or outside your group if you need to, to make sure that you've really got your head around this issue because it can be a lot of new stuff if it's something that you're not already experienced with or that is a little bit new to your world. Once you make some decisions around how you're going to manage this data, so are we going to track gender? If we are going to track gender, how are we going to do it? Where is it going to go in our database? Make sure to document your procedures and your standards so that you're all on the same page. And that's, of course, always the best practice for any sort of data management, um, but especially something that's reaching across pieces of your organization. Um, that's where we definitely want to make sure that we're all on the same page with our step-by-step -step documentation of here's how we do it. So let's take a look at some examples for how you're going to actually collect this data. Um, these are examples from outside the world of fundraising, but I thought they were really well done. So the first is an acupuncturist, and I had mentioned earlier um, in our talk that there are times where you might legitimately need to track information about somebody that um, is sensitive information, and how do you ask for that? So in this case, um, here's their contact information, their name, and then it also asks for their pronoun and their gender, identifying that those are not the same thing. And you'll notice that it doesn't say preferred pronoun or preferred gender, it just says pronoun and gender. And then at the bottom, you'll notice sex designated on insurance. So this is an example where this acupuncturist needs to collect that information because they have to bill insurance. So it's important that they have that information. But they also put it um, in the insurance information as a way of saying, this isn't about how I'm going to notice or appreciate your identity. This is about how I'm going to bill your insurance. So they were really thoughtful about the placement of where is this on their form. And also the wording, sex designated on insurance, saying clearly, like, I see that this is not who you are, but it's who your insurance company thinks you are, and so it's I need to know it for those purposes. So this is a really um, nicely done example of that. Another example, this is from the world of um, tax preparation. So taxpayer's legal name, their preferred name, and their pronoun. And so you'll notice this idea of preference comes up again, where um, preferred name feels acceptable because it's a name that the person has chosen for themselves. They've gone out and said, I'm going to choose a name, and it, it is this, um, versus pronoun, which is, I am this naturally. Um, and you notice also, though, this is an accountant. They need the person's legal name so that they can fire, file their taxes. So I think this is, these are both elegant ways of um, asking for that information when you are in a position that you need to ask for stuff that's a little bit more personal. I've also included some resources for you, and one of them is specifically on collecting data. So I definitely recommend, if this is something that you're working on, um, and I'm assuming a lot of us are out there, you're either probably in the midst of this, um, maybe you've already had this conversation and you just want to do a double check, like, did we get anything? Or perhaps you're, you're thinking, how am I going to begin this conversation? in my workplace. And I would love to hear um, any sorts of questions that folks might have or comments. If this is something that you've started working on at your organization, um, where are you at with it? Um, are you finding that you're getting the buy-in from your colleagues that you need on this? Or 
has it been a little bit more of a challenge? And that's something I'll mention too. I talked about bringing folks together in a group to problem solve around this. Sometimes the first step is really an educational step, um, that there may be people in your workplace who aren't aware that this is an issue, who aren't aware that your organization um, is not being as inclusive as you could be. And so the first step may be an educational one where it's it might be, if you're not well versed in these issues already, it might be um, educating yourself, accessing some of the resources I shared, and getting to be more conversant with issues around gender identity yourself, and then bringing that conversation to your workplace. Or if you're already fairly fluent in those issues, then it's finding those allies in your workplace who are likely to say, yeah, you're right, this is something we need to address. And um, of course, I'm going to now reference the part of the presentation where I, I put you all into a black hole of not seeing my screen, but uh, pointing out that slide of, hey, this is up and coming. You know, our, our young donors are going to expect this. They're, you know, 12 percent of them are not identifying um, their gender identity with the sex they were assigned at birth. That's a lot of people. And it's um, as we as a society become more inclusive and more tolerant, um, that number may even go up as more people feel comfortable saying, like, yeah, this is who I am. And, you know, being respected by the people around them for who they are. So with that, I would love um, any questions or comments that people might have to share. We've still got a few minutes together today. Hi, Amanda. We actually have a comment from Danielle. She says, my spouse is an LGBTQ plus employee research group that recommends that all employees put preferred names and pronouns in their business email signatures. I think that's a wonderful suggestion. And I have to admit that I, I was just looking at my email signature this morning and thinking, oh my gosh, I need to put my pronouns in there. So I love that. And if, if folks, um, if you start paying attention to the emails you're receiving, <clears throat> excuse me, from people, you're probably going to be seeing that more and more. So that really is a great best practice tip. So it's pretty easy in your email signature. You just say, um, my pronouns are, and then whatever they are. So for me, I would say my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And those might be different for you. And that's a nice way to make it easy for people to connect with you and know how to speak with you respectfully. It's also important that you do that no matter what your gender identity is. It's not just something to do if you're a transgender person. It's a way of saying that we, it makes it more inclusive and welcoming for everybody if we all take that proactive step of saying, here's how you can address me. Um, it kind of makes it not awkward if it's a universal practice. Great suggestion. Thank you. No problem. Um, we actually have another thing from Stephanie. She was knowing if you could go back to the resources slide just to oh, review. Yes. I sure can. Let me try to figure out how to make this guy go backwards. There we go. Oh. Whoops, too far. All right, there we go. And you will also get this. Um, I will be sharing the slideshow with everybody, and the links are live so that you'll be able to uh, get to whatever resource you want to see. Oh, thank you, Amanda. That's amazing. Absolutely. Also, Amanda, we have a question from Rob, and he wants to know, would our data be affected if we removed prefixes from our constituent names? Good question. So, I mean, the the main thing would be that you you know you wouldn't have those prefixes in there anymore. And you've got a couple of options. One is you could say, you know what, we're never going to use this data. We're going to wipe them out. And so maybe you do an import. And I've done this for clients before. Maybe you do an import where you import a null value to every single um, prefix field, or you get rid of your prefix field altogether. This is kind of like the, the most extreme option. Another option is to just say, you know what, we're not really sure yet how this is going to look for us. We're going to just simply stop using it. So if you're, you're concerned about a loss of data, you could say, okay, we're going to leave the data that we have in our prefix column currently. Now, actually, I'm going to problematize that. Um, <laughs> you're going to want to use your prefixes for your doctors and your lieutenant, you know, lieutenant colonels and your reverends. Um, so you might take that prefix data, and if you feel like I'm worried about data loss, you could export it to a spreadsheet. Like, now I have a conclusive record of all of the gender-based titles that were in our database as of April 17th of 2019. 
and then archive that, and then frankly, probably never ever touch it again, but at least now you feel comfortable that you have it. Another um, less likely to lose it in the gaping maw of your shared server option would be to um, create another field in your database that's like historical prefix and you can move that information. So if I used to be a mister in my prefix field, I move that over to my historical prefix. This is again so that we can preserve the prefix functionality for our doctors and our reverends of the world. Um, and then you can take that field, you can actually even hide it from your front end users so that it's, it's living in the back end of your database. You know you can access it if you ever have you know, a new executive director who's like, I wanna go back to using gender-based titles and you guys got rid of them all in 2019 and I can't believe this. Um, oh, actually we have them right here in the secret field of our database that nobody's seen for the last three years because we hit it. So those are a couple of options if you're worried about data loss. And if I didn't answer that question correctly, just type it again, <laughs> if, you, if you were asking something different. <laughs> yeah, we're still moderating the questions. Uh, we actually have a longer one from Stacy. Uh, we work at a theater that deals a lot with ticketing. For high value donors, we usually put their names on the seats before a show, such as Mr. John or Mrs. whoever. Would it be to our uh, advantage to remove the prefixes so that we are introducing gender exclusivity to our organization in theater? I'm going to answer that um, classic kind of consultant answer. And I'll give you two answers. Um, overall, I love and I'm very supportive of this general degendering of spaces when gender is not necessary. Um, so I think that's a wonderful goal. I would also, because these are your highest value donors, I would actually just ask them, I would say, hey, we're making, and I think depending on, okay, very much depending on your organizational culture and, you know, making sure that you have extreme buy-in at the leadership levels, you know, if, you're, if you are the chief development person or if there's a chief development person on staff that's not you, your executive director, making sure that everybody, because, you know, we're talking to our high value donors, but to tell them, hey, we're making some changes in the way that we, um, that we print out people's names and we're thinking about going to um, getting rid of the, the prefix and just listing you as um, Joan Johnson. Would that be okay with you or, or would you prefer to be Mrs. Joan Johnson? And frankly, the most important thing is honoring our donors' preferences. So what we could do is say, okay, we talked to um, our 50 top donors who we always put these you know, special placards out for. And of those, 48 of them were comfortable with not having their title. Great, get rid of it for those 48 people and let the other two people have their name represented exactly the way they want it to be. And that's the, mo I think that's a really important point about name standards um, and how we display the title is kind of part of our name standard. We should always let people choose an exception to the rule. So if I tell you, I never want you to address me as Ms. Amanda Jarman. I always want you to address me as Amanda, quote, the greatest, quote, Jarman. You have every right to laugh at me, number one. <laughs> but also, why not? You know, why not update um, my name in your database so that it shows that way? And of course, you're not going to do that for anybody else. You're not going to be like, oh, let's give everybody like quirky nicknames based on this one person's um, need and preference. So, so to recap, you know, make sure that everybody who needs to be is on board with polling those uh, high value donors, but then reach out to them and use it as an opportunity for engagement. So we, we want to steward you in the best way we possibly can. We want you to be as happy as you can be with the way that we're recognizing you. We're thinking about making this small change, but if it's important to you, we, would, we want to print your name exactly the way you want it to be. Cool. Thank you, Amanda. Um, if you can, can you go back to your uh, contact information slide just in case anyone has any additional questions? Because we have one that looks a little lengthy as well. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, and if you feel like any are like too long to address in this time, um, feel free to, I will follow up with you all offline um, very happily. And and yeah, definitely, um, you know, ask questions now, but if you later, you know, you're, it's, you've had your, um, last coffee of the day. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself here. I don't, maybe I need some more coffee, I guess. Um, but, and you're you know, chilling, you're thinking, you're like, gosh, I really wish I'd asked Amanda about this or that. Um, 
it's not too late. This is a topic that you know you can probably see I'm very passionate about, and um, I'm also passionate about just sharing what I know and getting to know um, my uh, my colleagues out there. So um, don't be shy about visiting my website, and there's a ample methods to contact me there too. All right, Amanda, we have a question from Brian. Uh, I work in the advancement office at a small college and would like to know how one would go about collecting data regarding gender identification and making said data uniform. But there are many individuals who simply do not respond to the usual methods of data collection, such as surveys or mailing. Ah, okay, that's a great question. So I am going to even broaden it a little bit, which is just generally how do we get our constituents to tell us about their, themselves? But I think in terms of um, the gender identity component of it, we've talked some about what are sensitive ways to ask for that information. Um, but in terms of how do we get people to actually give us the information we want, whether that's an updated mailing address, their email, their phone number, my favorite way of doing that is what's called content marketing, or basically giving people something in exchange for um, what you want. And so my, one of my favorite examples of this, there was a children's hospital, uh, I'll just say in Texas, sure. Um, there was a children's hospital in Texas that, uh, I'm not sure where it was, there was a children's hospital that did a really cool thing where they had an online form, and they used this as an acquisition tool, but you can certainly use this same concept with your own constituents. Um, and they said, give us your name and email address and you can download a free booklet on how to adjust an infant car seat so that it's safe. And of course, parents are like, oh my gosh, yes, I totally wanna have safe, my infant be safe in their car seat. And of course, for them as an acquisition, um, you know, they're looking for people who are parents who are likely to be interested in what they do. But if this is among your own constituents, if you are at a university, at a small college, if you are at a more traditional nonprofit organization, think about what kind of compelling information or content that you have that your constituents would like. So um, join us for this exclusive experience. We're gonna do a, a webinar that is about the plight of the um, aardvark that we're trying to save now just trailing into to crazy examples, um, but you're probably getting the idea that if you can offer something of value to your constituents. And so in this particular example where we're trying to collect gender identity information, we might say that, you know, hey, we're doing a demographic survey and every person who registers for our survey will either be entered to win some sort of awesome exclusive experience on our campus maybe, or if you've got people that are more far flung, every single person who fills out the survey will be invited to an exclusive online event where our star faculty member will be presenting their mind-blowing theory that has recently um, been all over the, the press. Or, um, so you get some ideas of, like that you've got something to offer. So offer people something in exchange for their data and they're so much more likely to give it to you. Cool. Well, thank you, Amanda. Um, everyone that attended, we'd like to appreciate you. And if you didn't have any questions answered, you're more than welcome to reach out to Amanda uh, by visiting her website. And just a reminder, everyone, you will be getting a copy of the slides and the recording um, from Amanda. And if you'd like to join us next week for streamlining major gift fundraising for areas of focus to achieve success. Amanda, we want to say thank you again for joining us. And uh, we love the information you were able to share. Oh, thank you so much for hosting me. It was a total pleasure to be here. And no problem. And everyone, take care. If you need anything, please reach out. Um, you can go to donorsearch.net and view any recorded uh, videos and check your emails for anything from us or Amanda.